The reality is is now on Patreon, and here are some of our fabulous supporters. Jesse Willis. I may not run in traffic, but I'll give you a run for your money. Rody. When you work in quality assurance, perfection comes easy. Tori Tuchilo. When Tori steps on the scene, you are his story. Eugene Henderson. In the game of life, I choose Jeopardy. Maria M. Where I come from, they sing God Save the Queen. The truth is, it's actually me. Becca Simon. If you can't stand the heat come to minnesota jill hirsch your petty drama can't take this warrior down jamie all some people call me cold but it's not me it's that minnesota weather sarah gibbs you may not like the cut of my jet but that's what you get from sarah gibbs richie d if you can't be cool you can't be with caduce megan shaw i may be a model but i'll never be a model minority samaj bledson the fun bus is here and i'm driving on the turn Mike. Eleanor Manning. I run with a fabulous circle of people, and they're not even on my payroll. Danny McLaughlin. First, I came out, and now I'm coming for everything. Kelly Paper. I may be from down under, but don't ever underestimate me. Seiran Hayati. In Sweden, we have ABBA, IKEA, and if you mess with me, some other four-letter words. Jessica Riley. Where I come from, money can buy you anything, but I'll take the garbage plate. Chastity Davis. Don't be fooled by my name. The only thing I abstain from is your bullshit. Sarah Watkins Bilstein. Playtime is over. This mom means business. Laura Zielinski. Whether it's breast pumping or fist bumping, this mama brings the party. Jill Walsh. I made it up the hill myself and I'll kick any jack off. And finally, diamonds aren't a girl's best friend. John Friedman is. good because uh-huh. I had the best Sunday night ever. Right? It started out in anticipation all day long. Yeah. But starting at eight o'clock, I just went through to like almost till one. I was up till one watching everything. I ended with Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, you did? You even Because I was already it. up and I was like, okay, let me just <laughs> yeah, watch you- that too. Yeah, adre- the adrenaline. Um, <laughs> no, I watched. So I didn't watch Succession last night, mm-hmm. but I did end up watching both of the shows, the Housewife shows. Mm-hmm. And at one point, right before the arrest or something, or right before the Fed showed up, my husband mm-hmm. asked me to do something for him. And I got so <sighs> mad at him. I was like, this is really important. He was like, no, listen, like my mom called from Pakistan. Like they really need something. And I was like, oh. Uh-huh. So I paused the show so I could help him out. And then and I was like, listen, a really important thing is happening right now. A housewife is about to get arrested. He was like, which one? And I was like, what do you mean, which one? How you do don't even know any of them. Yeah. What do you mean, which one? <laughs> and then he was like. The Muslim and- one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should have said that. What do you think? It's the Muslim one. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so he was like, he was like, wait, like, so do you want me to leave the room? I was like, no, you don't need to leave the room, but you could shut the fuck up. <laughs> Wait, can we, before we start talking about Potomac and Salt Lake City, because I'm slandering my husband, can I just can we just talk about what I told you? So my sweet sweet husband, my sweet husband is he's he's been posting on this like one forum. It's like a sports forum, and he's been posting on it for like 20 years or something, like since the dawn of the internet, right? And <laughs> so, and he's he, you know it's kind of like the Crappens community, like he's made mm-hmm. friends from it, all this stuff, and so I guess. He said there was, I didn't realize it, but there was like a Housewives or like a reality TV or Housewives thread. He went in and he just, it was so sweet of him. He commented, he left a message in the thread saying, I don't watch any of these shows, but my wife does a podcast. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to check it out, there's a link for the podcast. So shout outs to my husband for being. Oh my God, he's the sweetest. So sweet. My husband doesn't even know the name of the podcast. No, stop (laughs) it. Yes, he does. (laughs) No, so, so I said, I oh, well, told he, him he just didn't it did, never registered. <laughs> <laughs> so then he then shared with me the other day a comment from somebody after he had posted that. Uh huh. And somebody said, <laughs> Your wife and friend are super hilarious and thoughtful. I can listen to them she just shoot the shit all day. So sweet. <laughs> I don't know which one you are married to, but it doesn't matter <laughs> because either way, you get slandered. LOL. <laughs> 
I just slide with mine. I slide with mine all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and if you want to hear the real uncut slandering, you should go to the subscribe to our page. Patreon. <laughs> That's where the last Patreon we did slander them even more. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I, he sent sent me that screenshot, and I was just I like, I need to share that with Kirti. I haven't shown him that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oopsie. Uh, <laughs> All right, yeah. let's talk about. Can we talk about Potomac first? Mm, sure. Okay. So, what did you think about the setup at this reunion? Because to me, the set looked low budget. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it did look low budget. They were trying to do the goddess theme that they did. I thought um, Mia in the park with a circle of flowers for your head did a better job with the goddess theme than Andy did with all his budget. It was bizarre. I was it like, was. to make a set based off of one party that was fairly insignificant, like, why didn't you recreate yeah. Giselle's driveway or a construction right. scene? Or, you know what? Make it look like they're all sitting in a bowl of salad because or it made no the, yeah, the Chesapeake Bay. They could have done a whole theme of Chesapeake <laughs> the Bay. Chesapeake Bay. Literally anything else. Mia's, you know, stripper pool. It could have been, <laughs> Honestly. Ken, this- it could have been Candace's video shoot. The garage, the driveway that she did her video in. Yeah. And then the whole teasing Nicki Minaj, but she's not coming. Like, what? Also, yeah. the video that she sent and they played looked like yeah. it was filmed on a Blackberry underwater. Yes. <laughs> I was like, what is I this? I was like, is she like time traveling? Is this like from 1992 <laughs> on a flip phone? Is it like Tom Girardi's flip phone that she's <laughs> It was so weird. I was like, clearly she's in the backstage yeah. somewhere, yeah. right? Yeah. We know she's already there. Why couldn't you have her film another video and send it? Like, why yeah. did you use this one from 1997 on a Motorola Razor? I don't know. Like, I it don't was understand. very much my mother trying to talk to me on WhatsApp, you know, <laughs> pointing the camera to the ceiling, standing <laughs> with the light behind her so she looks like a dark silhouette. <laughs> she's in witness protection talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what it looked like yeah also the seating i think was interesting so at first i was really excited that wendy was sitting next to andy i was mm-hmm. like oh good for you wendy yeah. but as the episode went on i was like wendy needs to shut the fuck up <laughs> wendy the pendulum has all swung all the way to the other end. Now I'm like, Wendy, shut up. Shut yes. up. Yes. She was so obnoxious to Mia. She was. For somebody who's had a lot of plastic surgery, she was super obnoxious about Mia's plastic surgery. <laughs> it was super obnoxious the whole time. And then like oh she just God. kept having a whole separate conversation. And, mm-hmm. you know, whenever Ray comes on the podcast, she always says she takes a lot of pride in the times that she's right about a housewife. And I feel like somewhere. <laughs> Ray, if you're listening, she's like, I told you I was right about this one because she's right. Wendy is, Ray said, Wendy is behaving like a tryhard. And this reunion, I was like, who? It was like, who else? It was like, you know what was giving me? It was like, remember Bethany used to do this? Very much in the beginning. I think um, she pretty much did that and got, became Andy's friend because of that way, the way, the way she was yeah. behaving. It's like the sidebar conversations and the talking Just little about. snarky remarks yeah, and like yeah, tackling. Uh, it was like, this is not the Wendy show. Yeah. We need to calm not. down. You didn't bring yeah. that much. Like, I appreciated you on the show. I appreciated mm-hmm. you going head to head with Giselle and Robin and everything. But, like, that train has left, and I mm-hmm. don't understand what's happening right now. Yeah. Now, Giselle sitting next to Andy, I thought was really interesting because it made as little sense of Giselle sitting next to Andy as Kyle sitting next to Andy. <laughs> Yes, I think it's like, you know, Kyle, Giselle, people like them are Andy's Bravo family, like where they are considered a step closer to him. So he he puts them there just because they are part of his family. That's it. It's like they are the inner circle. There's like cir- concentric circles that to reach Andy. And this is one circle closer than the others. And that's all it is. Yeah, I think it was you that mentioned that like in Bravo Canada, which is on Hayu, mm-hmm. Giselle is a face of Bravo in Canada. Yeah. 
That is weird that nobody from New York is, no, nobody from Atlanta is. It's Giselle. Which is like fine. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I love Giselle. I think Giselle yeah. is necessary. No, but Potomac. she's also newer compared yeah. to the, the OG. She's not, she, I wouldn't call her the OG. She's somewhere in the middle. She is. But I think right now, considering like the momentum that Potomac has, mm. Giselle is the face of Potomac, mm. which is a big deal, I guess. But it mm. very much seems like we'll get to it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Mia segment. So we started more with the Mia segment and we learned absolutely nothing new about Mia. In fact, I am more confused than ever before about this woman. <laughs> she just said nonsense. I was like, she, I don't. There was so much speculation about what establishment she worked at and whether she was a stripper or not. And she wasn't the traditional around the corner strip joint stripper. She was just a high end stripper. Why do we have to ask her all the details? Like, oh, you wore a long gown and then you stripped out of the gown. Okay. How does that make any difference? I don't understand it. Well, I think the reason why they were asking all those questions was because Mia didn't make it very clear. I think the issue, and I I, I, I sympathize with Mia because there have been times when I've been in a friend group mm -hmm. and you're talking and you're trying to share a story and somebody finds one thing you say so insane that it derails a conversation and you never get to finish your thought. So yeah. I do think that what Mia was trying to say was like, yes, I did wear a gown. It was a high end establishment. You would take off the gown and then you would dance in your underwear. Yeah. But like, I don't think Mia ever got a chance to say that. And the girls say that. Like, I think Robin says that. But it's just, it's at the same time, it's like the other information that Mia gives is still not great because she's like, yeah, I mean, I met... <laughs> I met G there and, you know, I fell in love with him because of the Haiti earthquake fundraiser. Mm -hmm. I did stop thinking he was just some crazy guy who's barefoot in a strip Can you club. imagine walking barefoot in a strip club? And that is something they should have spent some more time on, but they just asked it and briefly and moved on. I'm like, Let's that was unhygienic. Let's now, unpack we've talked that. about how sho no shoes inside the house, but definitely wear shoes in a strip joint. What is this? <laughs> Or any other public setting. <laughs> Please keep your shoes on. But also, like, not surprising that this is what Gordon would do. Like, I'm not surprised that Gordon, the guy who was, like, wagging his fat tongue at Karen Huger in Chesapeake, would, like, casually – and he's not just casually strolling around a strip club without shoes on. This is somebody who's considered, a, like, one of their highest-end clients. This is mm -hmm. somebody who's considered, like, a big roller at a high-stakes strip club. Yeah. It, it, emphasis on stakes because they do sell stakes there. But this man who's in his – presumably in his 50s at this time is walking around with no shoes on – He's a father and a husband at this point to somebody yeah. else. Yeah. But also why? Why no shoes on? I no, of course. Of course. Uh, of course. The question is, why would you do that? All of it, it seems so crazy. It's so incredulous. It's like Erica Jane's story because this is like, and I think that's where they keep going back to it, but nobody's actually saying that or asking those questions the way they should. This seems to be something <laughs> like it's this, this string of words that are put together to form those sentences. This was not just a guy who was walking it's around mad barefoot. Lips. Yeah. Yeah. It's barefoot in a strip club, but he was actually helping somebody with Haiti and I fell in love with it. That whole sentence itself, it feels so weird, like Mad Libs. And like, yeah. how did you even come up with that? How do you conjure that up? Also, at one point, Mia calls herself a prostitute, which I was like, all right, that's bold. Yeah. She's like, I'm speaking from the experience of having been one. <laughs> She's yeah. like, she I was like, know. I only speak about things I, I know a lot about or something yeah. like that. I know <laughs> she was being self-deprecating, but at the same time, it was like, it's not when it's maybe also a fact. It's yeah. not. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. It's I'm not sure. Weird. I'm not yeah. sure. Which like, I was like, okay, okay, work, like bold. Great. Good job. Yeah. Like you're that owning was it. Mia, that was Mia's uh, um, Mary Martha moment when she's <laughs> trying to <laughs> joke and it doesn't quite go through. <laughs> Quite not well. quite, yeah. Like people are people are like, huh? Should we yeah. laugh? Should we not laugh? I'm not quite sure what to do. The Giselle segment was interesting because it's like, okay, why are we talking about her fashions again? Why? And why? why why are we look at everybody else on the stage like why a couple of you are okay but a lot of you also have other fashion 
full pause. But also this season, I don't think that Giselle did anything that insane with her no. fashions more so than last year. So it felt like weird filler footage to me to be talking about Giselle's fashion again. Yeah. And her purple wall that's no longer there anyway. So yeah, it was just bizarre to mm-hmm. focus on these things about Giselle, somebody who shared barely anything with us this season. Yeah. We talked about the Jamal storyline again, and I feel like Andy was like really trying to get Giselle to just like show some emotions. And I felt like he was like, hey, Giselle, look, I have you seated right next to me. It's time for you to be a little bit vulnerable. Open up. It's your turn. And she was just like, no, that's not what I do. But no. I see, I also kind of respect her. For, that she, that's not natural to her. And so she's not going to do anything unnatural for you. Were gonna for say, you. I know you were going to say, I respect her. That's not natural to me. <laughs> yeah, it's not natural to me either. But it's not natural for her to break down and cry and show emotions. And why would she want to do that? Why would she want to do a dance for TV and for Andy? That she's not going to do that. So I sort of respected that. At the same time, I am also like, felt like Andy was trying to make up for stuff he didn't do between the last reunion Mm -hmm. and this reunion. He felt like I did not pick on Giselle enough and the audience gave me that feedback so now I'm going to do that now. Which is like Andy, shut the fuck up. Like This isn't a show about you. Talking about something she couldn't even figure out when when did you break up with him? When was this? This was after or before the reunion. Why are we talking about the last season? Yeah, especially because we only talked about Jamal in the very beginning when she went to Candace's house and she said, mm-hmm. me and Jamal have broken up because of the coronavirus, yeah. right? Like, yeah. because of the pandemic. And it was strange because, yes, exactly what you said, where like Andy's now asking, like, when did you break up? What happened? And I get it. To some degree, he's holding Giselle's feet to the fire because Giselle likes to do this to other people. Mm-hmm. She likes to bring up rumors. She likes to bring up this shit. So fine. He's serving Giselle a taste of her own medicine, which I get and I appreciate. But it's like one scene season too late my dude like this is it's too late and also Giselle's answer of when they broke up sounded like when are the joggers of yeah it was a very (laughs) charade jogger moment yeah it was like (laughs) summer summer fall September yeah (laughs) she was like holidays earlier last year this year January I don't know yeah (laughs) and at that moment I appreciated Wendy because she was like I don't know what you're talking about I don't know why you're saying this when Mm. Jamal posted that video saying that you and him are not together or that he's single and Giselle just saying I didn't take it that way was like such it was such a bold and interesting choice that I had to respect it yeah I had to respect her response (laughs) I had to she was I was like whoa I need to learn from this woman and how to respond with a non-response. It was almost lawyer-like in a way. Yeah. You know, like it was crafty in that way where they were like, your ex released a video saying that he was single. So obviously yeah. you guys broke up a while ago. And she said, he meant we're not married. Yeah. And they were like, that's not what that means. Yeah. And she was like, well, that's what it meant to me. I was yeah. like, well, how do you refute that, right? Like, how yeah. do you how do you refute somebody saying this is how I perceive these words, yeah. especially when the words are about them? Yeah. So you're like, all right, Giselle, like maybe this is why you get the seat next to Andy. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, this, maybe this is it. Yeah. yeah she also yeah. did something else in that that was really funny to me. They asked, when did you find out that he was cheating on you or whatever? Yeah. And she was like, no, I just, I always knew. Yeah. And they're like, so you knew that you were being cheated on. And she was like, I didn't take it that way. Yeah. We were all just she, figuring it out. And then she almost that. said, she almost said we weren't together or we were dating other people. She almost said yeah. it. But then yes. she came back and said, we were figuring it out. And I was yeah. like, you are basically confirming what he said in that DM to that random lady that Monique yeah. pulled out in her binder, which was, yeah. Giselle is only doing this for the show. We're not even really together. We're dating other people. Like, right. And it's like, Giselle doesn't want to give anybody the satisfaction of ever being right about her. Yeah. So she finds a way to say it where somehow she gets off being yeah, right. Yeah, so Giselle has this I, ability. Yeah, Giselle is awesome in doing that and speaking coherently. And staying cool. And Karen has a way of doing the same thing, but then saying something nonsensical. Oh my God, yes. 
Oh. And so people start laughing and they're trying to figure out what did Karen say, like a drive by or, you know, drive through yeah. or drive by something of that sort. Karen will say something that will throw off people and they're like, what, what, what did she, did she just yeah. say that? And yeah. that's how she deflects it. Karen has that way of saying something that is funny to get them off track and go down a track that has nothing to do with what she was talking about anyway. So people forget brilliant. what they were asking her. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. It's master class. <laughs> it's a master class of deflection and shade in a way mm-hmm. that I don't think I've seen from other people. You know, I don't like Ramona at all, but it's almost mm-hmm. like a Ramona versus Bethany level. Right? Like mm-hmm. Bethany was always really good at deflecting and talking about th- something completely different and crafting her answer in such yeah. a way that the other person is kind of like taken aback by what she's just said. And Ramona also would be really good at doing that. Yeah. But Ramona was like Karen in that she would say something nonsensical and Bethany mm-hmm. is just really good with her words or really right. f- her way right. of speaking was right. Right. would throw right. you off. And that's yeah. how Giselle and Karen are. And that's why yeah. it works like yeah. so well. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and it's funny because they bring up this thing, which I, I'm so glad Andy brought that up, which is Wendy and Karen, you keep talking about Giselle needing a man, right? Like, yeah. it's the shit that you and I talk about all the time. <laughs> it's funny because Karen's response is so crazy. They're like, I, she says, I never did that. Yeah. <laughs> and Giselle goes, when you were getting ready for your renewal yeah, of your institution. institution. <laughs> she that says, you such a beautiful day. moment. <laughs> like, she uses it like with... <laughs> She is mocking Karen by using that term, but she's doing it in a such with such finesse yeah. that Karen actually takes it very seriously. She's like, "Yeah, that's an institution. You're right. Yes, my yes. marriage is an institution." Correct. And it's like, <laughs> so then then Karen says, because what Karen said in that scene was, "I keep being a man for twenty five years. That's not easy. Some people can't even get their man out of the phone, right?" <laughs> so Karen says first. She says <laughs> she didn't say anything. Then they call her out on say something then she says well you know what (laughs) she said she said something like i needed therapy and that's why i said it (laughs) but also saying that was like therapy i'm like like what (laughs) huh huh what it's like what i mean that's what i mean they're so (laughs) you're just so thrown off by what did she say and you're trying to break it down and understand and by the time you come back you're like okay that's like a few minutes of my life that i spent on something nonsensical let's move on (laughs) okay so it was stuff like this that was making me crack up and i was (laughs) For a long, it's been a long time since I watched a reunion and genuinely enjoyed myself. I laughed out loud, like not just not, I'm not saying, you know, just typing LOL in my phone and but not really laughing. (laughs) I was truly laughing out loud as I watched it. It was so (laughs) funny. Just because honestly, if you think about like, We had Beverly Hills reunion, which was super frustrating. Before that, we had Dallas reunion, which was super frustrating. We didn't get a New York reunion, which is also frustrating. And the reunion before that was a Potomac reunion. Yeah. Wasn't there a Jersey reunion? I think there was one. Oh, whoops. I forgot about Jersey. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. Yeah. Like, this was just such a refreshing hour of television because it was layered in with this kind of silliness that you were like, it's too fucking funny. Like, they're yeah. too funny with each other to be angry watching this. Yeah. What do you think of Darby's Barbie? Okay. The fact <laughs> that it started with Darby's Barbie, I was – my notes literally – so I I wrote my notes and then I revised them because I wrote down too much and I was like, this is too much stuff to cover because we have to talk about Salt Lake City. But my very first line of my notes was, yuck, Darby's Barbie. <laughs> Ew. No. Ew. No, I know. This is so wrong. I that was my only that. thought about Ashley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk about Candace. Oh, this part triggered me so much. It was exactly what you and I thought was going to happen. It's yes. exactly what you tweeted out. Yep. It was a lot of Andy wagging his uh, finger at um, Candace again. And she was like, even in her room, he, she's like, I'm not the one with the bad Twitter now. It's Mia. And he's like, nope, you still are the worst. Yeah. He asked this question, which he asked also Erica Jane. Okay. Mm-hmm. He asked Erica 
everybody's asking me to fire you. What do you think yeah, about that? Yeah, right. Yeah. And he very calmly posed that question to Erica. Yeah, now, yeah. reminder, Erica is being asked to be fired because she's in lawsuits for defrauding and stealing money from orphans mm-hmm. and widows. Mm-hmm. The be- reason why people want Candace to get fired is because she's throwing shade, which if you watch old seasons of Atlanta, this mm-hmm. is the shade. This is it's like Candace says, welcome yeah. to the show. This is the yeah. stage that we've set. Karen opened up the season by calling Giselle a fiery box and a broke whore. Like, yeah. why are we acting like this is not what we do on this show? Why are we why acting is like it only Candace that gets into trouble? Why is it only Candace why. that gets into it's trouble? It's not and like, okay, get everybody into trouble then. That's the yeah. point that we are making. We are not saying Candace is right. As we have always said, Candace, what she says is correct, but the way she says is, is wrong. Yeah, and Candace right? usually is retaliating. She's not coming yeah. for people. And Somebody she points it out. She points it out, but it's brushed over. Nobody is paying attention to that. They're just there to make sure that all of them, they all gang up and all they say is that she needs to behave. She needs to be quiet. She needs to shut up. She needs to not share what she thinks. And that if she did, the violence that she got would have been deserved. Andy actually says, this is why you got beat up. It was and insane he, that he said that. He the said fact that. that last season, they opened up with, oh, we don't condone violence. Mm-hmm. They opened the reunion up with that bullshit. For Andy to now be like, well, what has talking so much, what has it done for you? You got beat up. Mm-hmm. Excuse me? Are you fucking kidding me right Are now? Are you saying that she is to blame for someone being violent and not being able to use their words? Yeah. Really? And, and and are you saying that that's like, okay, that's like going to HR and saying I got harassed and your mm-hmm. boss being like, well, you probably did something to deserve that. Yeah. You probably you made were... them angry. You made them angry with your words yeah. and that's why it was okay for them to touch your body. Are you fucking yeah. kidding me, Andy Cohen? Really? That was the HR violation on TV. That, yes. that was a violation and that we watched happen and nobody called called out Andy on that. No, Andy probably never got a slap on the wrist for that. Not at all. Now, I've not read Dave Quinn's book, but I've been seeing a lot of excerpts from it. And in a lot of the book, Candace is calling out Andy a lot. And she's Mm -hmm. calling out Bravo a lot. And she's for the things that you and I talk about calling out Bravo, Mm -hmm. like about the colorism stuff, about the racism stuff, about the way that the ladies in Potomac are held to a different standard than the ladies in any other franchise. She Mm -hmm. says it in the book how Teresa, we know this, Teresa is Andy's, one of Andy's absolute favorite housewives of all Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Teresa Judice, who got famous for flipping a table, is Andy's favorite housewife of all time. And defrauding old people too. She did that too. She is a convicted felon. Yes. Okay. And she got a lot of one-on-one specials. Lots of one-on-one specials for Andy, with Andy, Mm -hmm. because Andy loves Teresa. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Andy is always getting down on Candace for what, using words that he doesn't really like? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what? Like somebody recently posted, it was from a couple of seasons ago. There was these like text exchange between Nini and Portia Mm -hmm. where Portia's calling Nini box body Mm -hmm. and daddy long legs and Nini's calling Portia a fat ass. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like none of it is okay, obviously, right? But like at the same time, you have people who are praising Nini and wanting her to come back on the show and being sad about Portia leaving the show who are also saying that Candace is a monster. One of the other things in the book that I read, I should just get the fucking book honestly. But in it, Candace and also Giselle talk about the narratives and the storylines and the character building in Potomac, which they were very open about, Mm -hmm. which is that Candace came in and her character was a rich, spoiled brat. Mm -hmm. She was, that was her character. That's why her mom, the wedding, you know, the trust fund kid, all this stuff was supposed to be used against her. Right. And it was used against her and it's been continued to be used against her. And that's why anytime Candace does anything for herself, everybody has to question it. Even this reunion, they're asking if Dorothy's on the deed. Why? Why? How, how is it any one of their business? Why, why is it relevant? Like, and you, your home situation, your financial situation is no better than Candace's. Why aren't we talking about the fact that Karen doesn't own her house? Yeah. How about that? Karen has been living in rentals for like the last four seasons. So like, 
what are we talking about here? Why are we talking about Candace's house or Candace's property or whatever? They talked about Candace's issues within her family with Chris and Dorothy. Mm -hmm. I feel like the issue between Chris and Dorothy is so much deeper than she showed on the show. And I think that what Ashley was saying about Chris was actually probably right. And I'm wondering, because I told you how they've been seen like out together, Ashley and Candace. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this is a thing that they will bond over, the fact that Chris and Candace's mother don't get along. Mm. I wonder if that's the thing that's going to make Ashley in. Because Candace I was surprised mother. that Ashley, first when she first started talking, she was actually very supportive of Candace. She came yes. off like being nice to Candace. Yes. She yes. was like, you know, Chris is, you know, he was a restaurant owner. He must have been really lost when the, all of that went, went yes. ha- happened during the COVID. And he's probably just trying to find himself. And then she takes a turn from there and goes into whether he's actually being paid by Candace. It was kind of like, okay, you're going down the right path. You're saying the right things. And all of a sudden you turn. Which is like the beautiful thing about these women and their relationship with <laughs> each other. But I'm excited to see next episode. I do appreciate that. Candace called out Mia because I think that she's right in that it's definitely not on Candace if Mia's mom relapses. And to be honest, there's a ton of fucking pressure that Mia's mother was put under by being on this show. At the yeah. same time, nobody is to blame for somebody relapsing. Then th- and I don't want to say blame. It's no one's fault if someone relapses yeah. because relapsing is a disease. Yeah. Addiction is a disease. We know that. So yeah. While I agree with Candace for calling out Mia and saying, don't put that on me, at the same time, I'm like, it shouldn't be put on anybody. Yeah. But if you're going to put it on anybody, it should probably be Mia. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was, it was, I I was very upset with Andy and how he was treating Candace for sure. It was so apparent that he doesn't like her. Yeah, he's picking on her for things that everybody else has done. Every housewife and their husbands have done over yep. the years. Yep. They've done every one of the things that Candace does. They don't get the same treatment. They Not just enough. don't. And Candace gets that. And Candace was, I felt for Candace in the moment where she was like crying about Chris and her mother. And she's and like, her I don't in-laws. know what to do. She's never talked in-laws. about her in-laws. Yeah. She's like, I don't. And she called them her family. She was like, yes. I have to use my family. And And I am torn because I don't know what to do with this. So I understand. And and to be honest, I think Karen was one of the people that was actually making sure she didn't take the bait that Dorothy was putting out. Like Dorothy was baiting everybody at the video shoot. She was going from person to person to person to person talking about it. And Karen was the only one that like pushed her away and said, oh, God, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Um. And Wendy a little bit, but I didn't remember what Robin had said. I remembered what yeah. Giselle had said, but I had forgotten what Robin had done. Also. Yeah, they were all messy. They were all messy because the minute that Dorothy came and started talking about Chris, they were so happy to jump on that wagon and just ask all kinds of questions, inappropriate questions of Dorothy. Yeah. And that is that is sad that every interaction that Candace has, she has to put up with that yeah that is, is hard. sad that is hard i'm and i am not a candy gal i'm i don't even want to You're be not. on candace's side i know but they make it so hard to not support her because the way they pick on her all the time i think that is my influence yeah <laughs> they pick on her and she lashes out really bad yes and that's that's the problem <laughs> okay Let's talk about Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. How wonderful was that? Oh, now everybody wants to focus on the arrest, which really was bone chilling. Mm -hmm. However, this Italian luncheon. Oh, my God. This was the highlight of Mary episode. And I'm just sad that both this story, Mary's story, and Jen's story is happening in the same season. Because each deserves a season of its own. Honestly. (laughs) Honestly. So I want to talk about Mary's luncheon. I want to talk about this, the escape before the arrest. But I also want to talk about 
Heather for a minute. So Mm -hmm. I was so bored because as soon as she came on and she started talking about ordering wine with her Mormon family, I was like, oh, God, this again. I was like, this is so boring. We get it. You drink now. It's not a big deal. But then she shared about how she was a very self-righteous person, how she was a judgmental Judy. And she told the story about being at a wedding and like not wanting to wear the spaghetti strap dresses because she wouldn't have, be able to wear her temple garment under it. And so she made everybody make her a custom bolero and she was such a bitch about it and all this stuff, right? And I thought it was interesting because I was like, oh, she's so aware of who yeah. she used to be. So yeah. like props to you. However, <laughs> you don't go from being a self-righteous, judgmental bitch uh-huh. to a normal human being overnight. Okay, you just yeah. take your judgment and you place it onto something else. So yeah. Heather used to judge people who were not religious enough. Yeah. She used to look down on them. And I think what's interesting is she is now judgmental of people who are not self-righteous. Yes. So she's, for example, this is why she is judgmental of Lisa Barlow. Because yeah. she's talking about like these, you know, she talks about the very funny different levels of yeah. Mormonism, how she's even lower than Jeffrey Dahmer and all this stuff. <laughs> it's super funny. But she she keeps talking about Lisa Barlow as this like super perfect Mormon. But as far as I've seen on the show, Lisa Barlow drinks. Lisa yeah. Barlow never wears her. Te- Maybe she does wear her temple garment sometimes, but she definitely didn't wear it many, many times on the many show. Times. She's shown yeah. with her shoulders and everything out. So yeah. even on Watch What Happens, she was on and her boobs looked amazing and she had yeah. like cleavage on her belly button. So yeah. I'm confused about why Heather has this idea that Lisa Barlow is like this like morally superior Mormon when Lisa Barlow is not a morally superior Mormon. She's just it, as not Mormon in the way that she practices her Mormonism. Yeah, I think as there's a difference. Heather. I think Heather comes, even though she comes from the Church of Latter day Saints, I think she's closer to the fundamental Mormon than she is to LDS church. At some point, maybe in the recent past, her family might have moved into the LDS church. The practices that they were practicing was more still from the fundamental Mormon community, right? Because yes. the ancestors, maybe not parents, but maybe the generation before them were polygamists and they were part of that fundamental Mormon church. And yeah. then they might have been part of founding the LDS church and all of that. But because they come from that fundamental background and they're not necessarily modern Mormons, they in her family, that her family might have had all of the fundamental principles still being followed, even if it is not necessarily sanctioned by the church. Mm. There is the underlying, you know, that happens in our community yeah, as well. Yeah. If your grandparents were very orthodox and your parents are not, you're still taught the orthodox way because you're still around your grandparents too. Yeah. So you're told what to do and what not to do in front of them and all of that. In Hindu Orthodox, yeah, we, I, my grandmother followed a lot of Orthodox stuff. My mother did not, but she would always try to teach us all of that. She taught us all of that. We were aware of it. There would be like some instances when somebody super Orthodox would come to our house and we had to behave a certain way in front of them because my mom would be like, don't do that. They're going to be offended. The, and maybe, and, yeah, you know, that all or nothing idea is sort of how mm-hmm. Heather yeah. grew up is that you don't get to live in the middle. You don't like yeah. you get to live in the gray parts of it. Correct. But I also think that Heather is having a private experience. That could be. And she might very well be having a private experience. Not everybody who leaves the church necessarily has to have the same bitter outlook. They may leave and be fine. Heather always talks, when she talks about leaving the church, she's always talking about it in terms of how she's not being accepted anymore, how she has been thrown out of it. Yes. She's, it's not like I am. I have left the church and I don't need it anymore. It's almost like I wish they would take me back, but allow me to live this lifestyle. I, I wish they would progress to where I am so I could be part of the church. I think Heather was, she says she was a judgmental, morally superior Mormon. Mm-hmm. And I think this is why she hates Lisa, because I think what's happening is Heather is projecting her own shame about her own actions onto other Mormons. Right. And assuming that that judgmental Judy that she was 
is the same way that she is going to be received for not practicing Mormonism in the perfect way that she she used to preach to she's, other people. To yeah, she's you know. projecting her former yes. thoughts yes. in on Lisa and saying Lisa must be thinking like this about me. Exactly. So that is, you know, you're just that's in your head, Heather. Nobody mm-hmm. else is sitting here judging you for how yeah. you're behaving. You're actually mm-hmm. judging yourself for how you're behaving and assuming mm-hmm. that somebody who is still a practicing Mormon would yeah. also judge you in that same way. I mm-hmm. mean, look, do I think that Lisa Barlow is a snob? Mm-hmm. Yes. Do I think yeah. Lisa Barlow is judgmental? Absolutely. I think she's judgmental about like clothes. Yeah. Or like she's judgmental you know. about what fast food you eat. Yes. She's judgmental about everything. She's new she's from New York. That's what you do. <laughs> Yes, exactly. She's judgmental in the way that like you and I are judgmental, but not necessarily judgmental in a way that would like send you to the outer darkness. (laughs) Yes. She's judgmental in the way that we like think makes a great housewife. But I just I thought it was so funny because it was like, oh, my God, Heather, like it's right there. It's right there. Nobody is judging you. You're judging you. You're still judging yourself for not being a good enough Mormon, even though you've left the Mormon church. And just being around other Mormons who are still a little bit practicing triggers you to a point where you remember who you used to be and how you used to judge other other people. Also, I don't believe that you go from being that bitchy to not being bitchy, which is also what explains to me why Heather is dying for like Jen Shah's attention or Jen Shaw's friendship like she's she's right. such a she's, she's she, such a sponge right she wants, she wants to belong she wants yeah she wants to belong and she wants drama so yes. she can start you know she can revel in it but she's not she doesn't want to be the one starting it she yeah, wants to which be is like she wants to be in the mix of it but that's all <laughs> yeah which is like exactly what religious exactly people are <laughs> no you're not she's uh, that she's behaving in the way that like religious women in like mosques mm-hmm. or churches or temples or whatever, mm-hmm. like those aunties, those judgy aunties, that's how they behave. They want to yes. know all the gossip so that they can judge you for it, but mostly because they like knowing the gossip because it's fun to gossip. Yes. And that's how Heather is. But it's just, yeah. it's serving us well right now because she's very entertaining this season. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It it's is. a lot of fun. Yeah. So we go to Mary's lunch mm-hmm. and Mary has been FaceTiming everyone to invite them to this Italiano lunch. It was like I know what happened. I think I know what happened. Tell me I what think happened. Mary, it was the pandemic. Mary was finally figured out how to use Netflix and <laughs> she just she just binged Sopranos for a while. She was like, "Oh, uh, and then she was like, "Now I want to eat pasta and I want to talk like them." <laughs> No, I have an even better theory. Because, you know, Mary once went on Instagram Live with Teresa Judice, and neither of them knew what the Mm. fuck was going on. (laughs) I have a feeling that Mary was like, I'm on Bravo. I guess I might as well watch some Rahasas of New Jersey (laughs) and, like, find out who this Teresa lady is. And then she was just like, okay, I'm going to just emulate what I saw on seasons one to three of Real Housewives of New Jersey. We're going to do an Italian lunch. I was going to say, I'm not even Italian. I'm just from New Jersey. And (laughs) New Jersey has, North Jersey has like a very heavy (laughs) Italian culture, as you see in Real Housewives of New Jersey. And I was like offended. I was like, I don't like this (laughs) accent. Why are you doing this, Mary? (laughs) Oh my God, Mary wants friends so desperately. She Mary has, doesn't have friends. She doesn't know she how doesn't to be have friends. Being. She has parishioners who obey her. She's never. I don't think she's ever had friends growing up. Never in so her life. So she has had grandpa, grandfathers, and grandmothers, and the church telling her what to do. And so now she has. She is so stunted in her growth. That's what I all, I'm always I am always yeah. coming back to. She has gone through a lot of trauma. There's trauma that she probably doesn't even realize that she went through and that she's never had a friend. She's never had a social interaction of any sort that would be meaningful. And now all of a sudden, she's trying to make friends, be friends with these women that expect to be treated equal to her. And she has no equal friends. So she doesn't even know how to behave with them. And if they don't respond a certain way, she takes offense to it. She either thinks that they are mocking her. So she leans into her 
inferiority complex or she thinks she's superior than them and that they are insulting her and that she should you know smack them with jesus right so that's what (laughs) that's where she is she like swings between the two extremes of being morally super superior to them or feeling super inferior to them and she wants to just be whitney she just wants whitney to pick up the phone and answer her that she thinks is the only thing a friend can do and if that person doesn't do that then they're not her friend they must be making Making fun of her behind her back. It's psychotic. Yes. It's so crazy. And then the fact that she gets mad at Whitney and is like, well, I'm going to tell her to wear the wrong clothes to the party. It's exactly how you do it in a teen movie like this is the shit that they do on like a disney channel movie this is what would happen to like lizzie mcguire like this is not the way a normal adult functions and honestly some of it was hilarious but a lot of it made me very uncomfortable to watch like it was was weird because usually usually I'm like cracking up and you're like, oh, this is hard to watch. And I know this time you were like, this is so funny. This should never end. And I was like, I cannot watch this anymore. (laughs) I enjoyed every bit of it from Mary, uh, you know, karate chopping her cushions (laughs) to trying to call Whitney and then (laughs) setting up Whitney. So she actually worked on her flyer that she sent out. She actually changed it to bikini picture. Like, what is that mafia girl? Like, Who how did she come that? up with that? No, and I'm telling you, this is something that she saw in, like, a Disney Channel That's movie what? that she watched during the pandemic. Somebody got yeah, her Disney I'm telling Plus. you, she was watching Sopranos. She was, like, slapping the pictures of Mafia of, like, strippers. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody shared on Twitter, it was, there was some sort of a party in Real Houses of Beverly Hills Mm -hmm. where Kim Richards came in dressed exactly like in the costume (laughs) that Mary wanted Whitney to come in. But then the fact that Whitney gets there and Whitney like obviously didn't take the bait, Mary gets more mad at her because Mary, as soon as she realizes that it didn't work, that she wasn't able to fool someone, the the fact that she wasn't able to make somebody feel bad, it reminds her again of her own inferiority, like you said, and then she just lashes out. First mad that Whitney wasn't being her bestie and picking up the phone, and then she got mad that she couldn't make a fool of Whitney and that her joke fell apart. She couldn't even take it in a good sense and like, oh, man, I wish you had. I wanted you to dress up like that. And then Whitney actually let that go. She didn't even bring that up no. again. And Mary was like, but this was supposed to be the biggest joke and everybody was supposed to laugh and no one's laughing right now. It was Why so isn't anyone so laughing at my Italian accent and <laughs> at my jokes, the mafia joke I made? It was a lot. She comes from a congregation where everybody falls on their you know at her feet and just worships her to this group that doesn't even understand what she's doing so they just sit there even when they sit down for the lunch and they're sitting there at first when they make the pasta and then they're sitting down for lunch they all look so uncomfortable and yes. awkward yeah like we are here because we need to be and because she called us but half of us half of me is scared of her and the other half is like why am i here yeah. Between- not one of them is comfortable around Mary. Maybe no, Meredith. <laughs> not maybe Meredith. But like I just think Meredith is so heavily medicated that that's like how she gets through it. <laughs> I did think it was some it was telling to me that Whitney apparently has been getting these angry text messages from Mary over the last year. So mm-hmm. it sounds to me like cuz remember even last season the only person that would ever film with Whitney would be or with Mary was Whitney. Whitney mm-hmm. was shown a couple of times FaceTime with Mary and she was shown visiting Mary in her closet. Yeah. But besides that nobody else really it was like once with Lisa Barlow very early on in the season and then it was only Whitney that would talk to right. Mary. Right. And then and, and Whitney is right in saying that she single handedly was Mary's PR for yes. Bravo. I mean, nobody else seemed to be talking to Mary at yes. all. Yes. But I think also what she says when she was when she says she was single handedly Mary's PR is mm-hmm. that she also mentions that she really showed Mary's church to be really good because mm-hmm. of what it did for her father. So mm-hmm. she brought a lot of attention, That's like good true. attention to Mary's church. But also I think what the reason why she's crying, I think there's two reasons why she's crying i think whitney is drunk (laughs) because you don't start crying like that because also the fight that they're having at the table i'm like you i get that mary doesn't understand things but whitney you are drunk right now like the way that she starts being like 
I want you to listen to Jen. Listen to Jen. Jen said something really nice about you. Listen to Jen. And Mary's like, shut up. I'm trying to listen to listen. (laughs) Yeah. Like (laughs) the fact that she keeps repeating that over and over again. And then even when Mary calls her a little girl, (laughs) Whitney goes, I am not a little girl. I am a mature woman. I'm like, (laughs) these are the responses of a drunk person. Like no (laughs) actual mature adult. If somebody called... Uh, somebody like Mary called me a little girl, I would just laugh and be like, this is not worth engaging in. The yeah. fact that Whitney keeps engaging with her was like, okay, so she's obviously under the influence. But also, when she says that she hit all those texts and she's like crying to Meredith or whatever, and oh, yeah. oh, another tell about Whitney being drunk is when she was like, Mary Cosby, I loved you. <laughs> <laughs> and the gloves are off. <laughs> what are you talking about, Whitney? <laughs> But then Whitney is telling Meredith about all of these berating texts that Mary will casually send Whitney when Whitney doesn't pick up the phone. It sounded to me like these are messages that have that she has gotten over the last year that when Mary lashes out, she sends these messages. And I wonder if the reason why Whitney made an effort to not bring that up ever uh-huh. was because of the obligation she felt. Because remember last season at the reunion, Mary said that she thought Whitney and Heather were racist. Yes. So I feel like we started crying because she probably felt like, here's this person who has berated me. I -hmm. kept it a secret because I didn't want to be the person, the white woman that Mm -hmm. talks about this black woman in a negative way. I didn't Mm want to be that person. Yeah, I forgot about that. So I wonder if that was some of the reason why she was crying. But also, I feel like Meredith set her up in that moment to bring up the stuff about that other dude Mm -hmm. and the church. I feel like Mm -hmm. Meredith found her in. Because remember, originally, Whitney was supposed to come to that event. Yes. And I don't believe for a minute that Meredith didn't know that Lisa was going to have this guy come and talk about Mary. Because Meredith and Lisa are buddies. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're talking about these things regularly. Right. I think the intention always was for Whitney to be the one that takes Mary down. For Whitney to be the vehicle with which these rumors pass. And I think that Meredith found her in in that moment with Whitney. And like this is um on Watch What Crappens, they yeah. always say this about Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, which is that this is community theater. Yes. Yes. Like they're not very good yes, at hiding they're what they're doing. Yes. They're which not. is why it's always so funny when Whitney's That's like why Jen ah. got arrested. <laughs> yeah. It's always so funny when Whitney's like, I've figured you out. And it's like you've not had to work yeah. very hard to figure yeah. anybody out. <laughs> That's right. But also, so yes, so Meredith put the seed of doubt in Whitney, but Whitney was holding on to so much. Yeah. And the kind of text that Mary is sending, that is like, that is truly terrifying. This is like Whitney was part of a church and she was berating somebody in her church. Yes. That's what it sounds like. That's crazy. That If I got that from my coworker in my workplace, that would be like scary. This is like, I cannot believe that Whitney was getting those texts and was keeping them quiet, keeping quiet about it. Yeah. It's just unbelievable for me. I think that there's definitely a lot to do with the optics of what that would look like Mm. if she was the one that would would release them. Yeah. And I think that Whitney is very aware of her presence on social media. Mm. Now, we finally get to the moment that we were all waiting for. You mean the vow renew- renewal between Stu Chains and Jensha on a snow <laughs> when they were walking in the snowshoes? Oh my god. <laughs> You there know was that- a lot of that. I was like, what? wow, Brower really covered her. They were like, I don't know if they were anticipating or this is just the kind of B-roll that they usually have. And they just happened to have a lot of B-roll on Jen that was specifically between Jen and Stu Chains. Well, we said it before, right? Like that this was an entire season that was going to be built up about how good Jen Shaw is. The entire mm-hmm. season is, every episode is all about Jen Jen being like, I'm building up my relationship with my children who like clearly can't stand her. And even in this meeting with like Stu, she's like, it's so good what I learned in therapy. It was so helpful to me and my kids. I do so much for them and I do so much for your your kids kids, and I do so much for all the people who we feed through our companies. Right. 
But also, it's like, if she hadn't been arrested, she would have been successful. Yes. The season would have been her redemption arc yep. because she's been doing good. She just had one blow up so far. Yep. But other than that, she's been behaving. She's not the center of the drama. The drama would have been between Mary and Lisa. Yeah. In Lisa and Whitney. And that's where the focus of the season would have been. And Jen would have been on the sideline with Heather enjoying the whole season, having fun. Yep. And she might have actually gotten away with it. And wow. here we are. Yeah. So everybody's packing to go to Vail. They're meeting up at the parking lot of Beauty Lab and Laser. Mm -hmm. Everybody's having a great time. And... Jen Shaw gets a phone call. Yeah. The most amazing thing about this was that we obviously got a clip of this in the very beginning of the season, mm -hmm. but the excuse that Jen gives <laughs> when she needs to leave yeah. was the most insane part of this whole thing. The fact that she very calmly says to them, Sharif Sr. Sharif Sr. is having internal bleeding and he in might need hospital. surgery. I'm sorry, what? And for her to say it so calmly and not have like any emotions or anything. I mean, we've seen this woman cry over less. Yeah, it almost felt like did someone, did Sharif give her that line when he called her? Because it was like she kept repeating it over and over again. So it almost felt like, did she come up with internal? She could have just said he's sick in the hospital. All I know is he's in the hospital. But the fact that she came up with internal bleeding, <laughs> it made me feel like, what happened? Did someone have internal bleeding in the recent past so it pops up in her head? Or is this something somebody told her to say? Yeah. And, yeah. The one thing that was uh, funny was she tells Whitney to turn off her, her mic. Yes. Then she has the phone call. But then when she comes back and say goodbye to Heather and all of that, her mic is on again. I think that... Because the she's talking and then she comes into the van and then she stands by the door and she announces. And I don't know if there was some other mic that was picking up it may have been that, but it may have been a boom mic. It may have been the other women's mics than any of that. But it was so I was surprised by how much how long she she hung out there after she got the phone call. I thought she would just leave right away. So I think what was happening was she got the phone call and then her partner, whatever, her assistant that was there starts uh -huh. to unload their stuff. Because remember when they get yeah. there, they load all the stuff yeah, into yeah, that yeah. other van. So I think they're unloading all the stuff and putting it back into the other truck. And she's trying to stay cool, calm, and collect. But the funniest part about all of it is also that like Heather and Lisa and all of them are like, are you okay? Do you want me to come with you? Are you going to be okay? Should we cancel the trip? We can stay back. It's totally fine. Are you going to be all right? And you can tell in Jen's mind, like, you know, this is this is this is how I believe that she is a master manipulator and yeah. an actual criminal because her ability to stay so calm during all this and be like, no, it's fine. You know what? I'm going to go check it out and see if it's not too serious. And then I'll just like fly private. Yeah. I'm sorry. Your husband is possibly bleeding to death. And you, she's like, don't worry about it, guys. I'll get you later in veil. Like, so, yeah, there, she's like uncanny <laughs> it's unbelievable that this yeah. woman is this way it's but do you think that if they had canceled the trip do you think that any one of them would have called mary to let her know that the trip was canceled <laughs> <laughs> no they wouldn't have i can't they wait have it's okay. mary would have been driving to way all by herself to meet with meredith <laughs> yeah, mary's getting on a pj to veil okay <laughs> so funny oh. also what was great was so they're all just like yap 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 blah 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 it was they're almost like snacks and <laughs> yeah but the <laughs> footage of the feds just walking in the window was like it was like some sinister <laughs> horror movie shit yeah it was like <laughs> what is hsi what does that mean <laughs> What is that They're mean? also so nice about it. They're like, yeah. he, the guy pops in. He's like, hi, hello. And Whitney's <laughs> like, hi. Uh, <laughs> how are you guys doing? They're like, good. <laughs> and it's like, we just want to check on Jen. Make sure she's okay. Like, just making sure she's okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, let, let's talk about that. Why yeah. did Homeland Security, first of all, why was Homeland Security there? Why was NYPD there? Because of offshore, I think Homeland Security was there because of offshore accounts, because it's their jurisdiction and oh. 
because it's involved outside entities outside of the U.S. Oh. NYPD was there because the warrant was being issued by NYPD. I think there was one person from NYPD who was issuing the warrant. FBI was there to help that. And then Homeland Security is also coming in because maybe the way the case is set up is because she has offshore accounts. Mm. But they kept asking, we just want to make sure she's okay. Mm -hmm. Is she okay? How is she doing? Is she okay? Why do they keep saying that? I don't know. I don't know. I can't wait for the next episode because the entire episode is the eight hours from Mm -hmm. the arrest moving forward. So it's these ladies just being together and taking in all the information as we were getting the information Mm -hmm. of Jen getting arrested and all this stuff. And I can't wait to see how people like Whitney and Lisa, who clearly have a feud, coming together because they're like, well, you know, I know we were fighting about this, but at least we are not going to the same prison. (laughs) I hope you and I won't go to the prison. You it's know? like at least we're not defrauding, you know, yeah, stealing money from old people. Like at right. least we're not doing that. I wonder if yeah. there's gonna be like a everybody come together. Cause you know, my favorite things about watching Salt Lake City this season and just j- in general since Jen Shaw's arrest was mm-hmm. it didn't matter if you were Team Candace or Team Monique, it didn't matter if you were Team Kenya or Team mm-hmm. Phaedra. Mm-hmm. The entire Bravo universe came together against Jen Shaw. And I just hope that that same fate is what happens with this group because it's so good. It's so good. I cannot wait to see what happens. How the fact that we saw how each of them reacted. Yes. um, To the news and how the jaws were dropping. And then um, Heather says, should I call Jen and let her know? And Lisa's like, I don't think so. But Lisa is going and calling Stu Chains. So I was surprised that everybody had Stu Chains number. Everybody's calling Stu Chain. How quick Lisa was to sort of go from I'm going to throw up to this isn't about Sharif, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly realizing what it really was, how mm-hmm. calm she seemed. I felt like even though she had sunglasses on, I felt like she would have probably looked at the cameras and been like, I fucking knew this was going to happen. Because, you yeah. know, Lisa has probably been around people who have done business with Jen. She was saying that in Watch What Happens Live that he asked, how did you immediately figure that out? <laughs> it wasn't about Cherie. And she's like, my brain just works fast. <laughs> and apparently she said that she called many of her lawyers number of her lawyers yeah. and yeah, that's Erica. where it's shown next week where she lisa calls all of her lawyers to figure out what's on the docket she says i wanted to know what was on the docket yeah so these she are is smart like, women yeah lisa these are actually smart women. yeah these are actually smart women they're not just like frivolous women and they're actually smart also in the sense that they've studied these damn shows for so long so I feel like they know what they're doing Lisa said that because it was beauty lab a parking lot she was was wondering what happened well yeah I saw that what did Heather do (laughs) yeah I do wonder sometimes, like, it's weird to have these big things happen on Bravo, right? Like these, Mm -hmm. like Erica Jane or Jen Shaw, like these big things that are happening. Mm -hmm. I just hope that people still watch the show and appreciate the other petty shit, right? Like, I I hope that you appreciate the fight between Lisa and Whitney because that's still one of my favorite fights. It's so dumb. It it's is. so stupid, but I still love it. Like, I still love Karen versus yeah. Giselle. Yeah, you know? I love the Whitney versus Mary, where Whitney keeps saying, I was in a carpool. I was <laughs> in, like, for 24 hours? You were in a carpool for 24 hours? She said the psycho, She's my like, God. I am in the carpool with other people's kids. I couldn't take a- It was so funny, the carpool. I'm in a carpool. <laughs> but that's the thing. Uh, like, I hope people understand. And here's, here's, I think I feel this way about it. There's a lot of new viewers of Bravo because Mm -hmm. of these big stories. Mm -hmm. And to those new viewers, I say, fuck off, okay? You haven't been here the whole time. Yeah. And then there's those of us who have, like, been here since, like, you know, the Jill versus Alex fights. Yes. We've been around since. Before that, it was Jill versus her dog. Yeah. We've been here (laughs) since before, you know, there was a family van sent to Vicky. So, like. For those of us, those are the stupid, petty, hilarious moments that we continue to love to watch. Yes. Yes. I just hope that it makes people still – like, I hope people still appreciate it. And I do appreciate Bravo for putting in the arrest with this Italian luncheon fight. Mm -hmm. Also, at the 
fucking luncheon. Mary is so fucking weird. Kelly Pafer, a listener, she pointed this out to me. It was so funny. She gave everybody these aprons, right? Yes. In Louis Vuitton gift bags. Yeah. And then she was like, I'm not giving them Louis Vuitton. That's crazy, right? Yeah. But then why did you put them in the Louis Vuitton gift bags? Because Louis Vuitton is a French brand. (laughs) I bet she just holds on to bags like me when I go to Giant and I don't bring my bag with me mm-hmm. and then I get a bag from there and then I just store. I just have all of those bags. I'm pretty sure Mary just like <laughs> buys things from like Shein and like Ooh, uses like, that. No, no, Wish. She yes. probably gets it from Wish. She got it from Wish. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And because I don't believe for a second that those are even real Louis Vuitton gift bags. They're yes. not. Yeah. But even like she thinks that she's such a fashionista that she was like, oh, I don't trust these women in their fashions, mm-hmm. but I'm going to give them these like Etsy aprons or like she got somebody to make it on a cricket of these aprons of their names and put them in Louis Vuitton bags. I was just like, what an anomaly. You she's are. not wrong in calling out some of the Salt Lake City fashion. But I mean, she should call out herself. OK, too. but yeah, like glass but houses. It, Hello, it made me come think on. about Giselle. I was like, Giselle would make fit so well. Giselle's fashion would fit in with Mary's. <laughs> like they I would- mean, I want to give Giselle a little bit more credit than that. I will say, have you seen Giselle's TikToks? They are good. She is, she is looking better in them. In the clothes. I'm not talking about her dance. Okay, the yeah. Look okay. The clothes look better, but the dances aren't insane. The videos yeah. are insane. There's yeah. one video where she was just doing nothing, then it cuts to a coffee mug, then she goes back to her face, then it cuts to a plant. She's doing nothing in the video. That's all it is. It's 15 that seconds. That would be me this. on TikTok. Okay, don't. I, don't. I want to know what to do with TikTok. Yeah, but then it's like, don't do it. Don't make a TikTok. There's another one where she does another one of those things where it cuts to her daughters and they're clearly like covering their face. Like, my God, your mom, you're so embarrassed. Embarrassing. And it just cuts back to Giselle just like smiling and dancing. You're like, but that's the beauty of TikTok. You can do anything and post anything. If okay, you can, follow, you can watch it. <laughs> no, stop it. Don't, don't. Okay, I'm this is a follow. generational difference right here. Of like, I'm going to follow Giselle. I th- I'm like, wh- how is this any different from anything else? No, <laughs> no, it's very different than other things on TikTok. <laughs> Giselle is doing nothing. She's just. I'm going to follow. Giselle is getting by. I think that's brilliant. That's how no. you troll TikTok. <laughs> Giselle is getting by in life by being an absolutely fucking beautiful woman. Okay. <laughs> she I'm was like follow her now like the- i'm like i'm gonna be like a like follow whatever that is called follow your page or whatever <laughs> yfp or whatever for you page is a totally different i'm cutting this part out because you sound <laughs> like you are the oldest person in the world what yfp is you page? yfp <laughs> what is that <laughs> I don't get it. We need to I end this episode. <laughs> I look at it. I get look at it. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. Why did you come up with new stuff or new <laughs> things? <laughs> this is so. I'm sweating from laughing so hard. <laughs> I don't understand TikTok. I'm telling you, Giselle and I. Do you even follow somebody on TikTok? Because if that's what you do, then I'll do it for Giselle. Yes, of course you can follow somebody on TikTok. I think mine is yeah, social I think, media. Uh, this old lady needs to follow that old lady. I need to support old ladies. Oh my TikTok. God, I feel like you're going to later on, you're going to be like, I'm going to send you a Facebook. Like, don't. Okay. <laughs> Oh, God. All right. Well, guys, <laughs> we'll be back on Saturday to talk about Vanderpump Rules and a bunch of other real random stuff. Yo. All right, guys, we'll talk to you on Saturday. Bye. Bye. The reality is, is now on Patreon, and here are some of our fabulous supporters. Tracy Newman. My presence is a gift, so remember the thank you note. Lily. Some people say I'm too much, but she's just starting. Marl Farsi. Reading is fundamental, and in Farsi, the reads are monumental. Tracy Masters. When you're the master of your own destiny, no one can take you down. 
Amanda Agosti. Some Amandas are tax bots, but this Amanda is as real as it gets. Ade Ade Dokun. It may look like I'm stirring the pot, but actually I'm just smoking it. Paula Bretrude. If you think I'm a bitch, you're probably right, and you probably deserved it. Lola Del Rio. Whatever Lola wants, Lola gets, and I get it all. Naveen Jonathan. I'll give you the shirt off my back, and also my unsolicited opinion. Jada. People are intimidated by my great success and my great ass. Deepa Kunapoli. Some people say I have secrets, but at least they're not federal indictments. Hadil Ibrahim. Some things are too hot to handle, like me and the tea I spill. Srinidhi Subramaniam. I have four degrees, eight syllables, and zero Fs to give. Shannon Anthony. There's no fun in moderation, but there's plenty of shade. Brianna Tooney. Some people strive for perfection, but I'm already there. Rita Ryan. Don't be fooled by my Midwest charm, because I'm nobody's fool. And finally, Beth Bayer. The secret to my success is staying out of your BS. 